What has been happening in interventional neuroradiology? How have you... Mm, a lot. It's a fast evaluating field. Um, maybe it's what's going even around uh, INR, which is uh, the potentially extend of use of thrombectomy if, um, if narrenity uh, proves to be efficient. Uh, Escape NA1 did not bring the expected results, but still show that if patients don't get lysis, then narrenity uh, seems to be very efficient. And uh, the results of the different trials, uh, whether to combine thrombectomy to IV lysis are variable. It still seems to be a little bit of a advantage but not really an important advantage. If Nirenity, the study going on now, Escape Next, proves to be efficient, that's going to be a very important step because if you compare something potentially super efficient, NA1, to something which in combination to thrombectomy is more or less efficient, then we'll have some further chance to help our patients. That could be critical in stroke far from a center. Or how do you see that evolving in terms of the offering of the protection? Uh, the geographic uh, conditions are very different according to where you work. Most of the population throughout the world is still living in large cities and the uh, amount of centers offering treatments is always increasing. So transportation for very large country um, uh, Canada or other places is indeed a problem, but I think it only concerns a not so large amount of population, but certainly in those patients it may help uh, by offering um, medical treatment before endovascular treatment is being done. Enlarging a little bit the time period that you have. Absolutely. Study Dawn is already a couple of years old, but we know now that uh, looking at the brain tissue is more important than uh, looking just at the clock. Uh, even if uh, clock is still the most important thing because uh, the more time passes by, the less you have chances to Do you think we're patient. going to enlarge the um, patients who get thrombectomy? Will we... Yes, definitely. Now we are wondering whether the distal thrombectomy should have to, should have to be done in let's call them distal or medium sized vessels, at least beyond M2. Are, uh, we have devices, we did not have the proper devices. Now that we have devices, we must learn how to use them. So the conditions to use are probably not the same. They are probably more dangerous to be used. So um, this time is not about um, uh, having everybody using it immediately, but developing the technique to be good enough to be able to treat those patients. Do you want to speak a little about aneurysms and how you choose your your approach? Aneurysms, we have uh, again multiple multiple ways to do different things. That's the most interesting see that to think to see today in that. Uh, each aneurysm can be treated by um, various combinations and either you follow the hypes of each new device that comes out jumping from mm -hmm. the newest to the even newest one or you may stay uh, more conservative at least uh, what is important in the end is ability to treat as low risk and stability of treatment and both are very important that's why um, I'm happy to work with one company to launch a study, a sealant study, to see the stability with time when using some of the devices. I imagine that then patient selection becomes critical in, in all of these. The willingness to treat is rather increasing, the number of devices is increasing. Shall we treat each patient with each small aneurysm? It's something uh, which is not established and the answer is probably less than we do. It, all, it makes me think that what, there's the present problem of double antiplatelet treatment. Mm -hmm. So in certain devices you would use that, certain patients may have bleeding risk. How do you deal with that? So the trend within the last years is to change and to evaluate from the classical um, P2Y12 uh, inhibitors, uh, clopidogrel, to the new 
uh, equivalent inhibitors with the advantage that there is less resistance. Definitely that's an important point, but with the drawback that there are potentially too much efficient. So um, we're expecting a study to be published very soon to show the efficiency of uh, doing testing when um, uh, when antiagregants are being used and I believe that all this is moving towards establishing some thresholds of minimum of efficiency and maximum of efficiency. Mm -hmm. So only more efficient has also its limits and we know we need to find a way to limit it on both sides. Very interesting. Any other points you would like to touch on today? Oh, in my practice, the use of transvenous embolization technique yes, is something which is increasing a lot. Um, AVM embolization is something which is rather getting progressively lower because of the negative results of Aruba technique, because of uh, so potentially good surgical results in rather small AVMs or superficial AVMs. But the tricky ones are still the large ones, the deep ones, and from this point of view, the access through the vein is a very important evolution with the drawback that it uh, has one major uh, drawback, which is if the vein is occluded and all the shunts are not obliterated, then the AVM might bleed and that's why it must be considered with a lot of care. It's not the point of just being able to do something, it's to control as much as possible. So transvenous embolization requires a lot more efforts. It requires first access to all the arteries, getting to the AVM before treatment, then access to the vein to embolize the AVM and in the end re-access all arteries to make sure that all of the, all of them are done. Mm -hmm. But this enables to, to treat uh, very difficult situations and I think that if we're able to push embolization in that direction then um, we may have other good arguments in compared to other techniques. Well thank you very much for being with us. Well, a pleasure, thank you.